This is the 19th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats. Striking Luke. This is the 19th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats. Striking Lures. Aftco. Pro Guide Batteries. X Zone Lures. Shoreline Boat and RV Repair. Spro. Gamakatsu. Big Bite Baits. The Bass Tank. Denali Rods. Beatdown Outdoors. And Sunline. BTL coming at you. Good afternoon. And welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where we're going to talk about bass fishing. Double dose of BTL today. Kick things off with, I'm going to say, one of the uh, one of the most natural anglers uh, that I've had the pleasure of interviewing and kind of getting to know and be around in a while. And that is none other than Brian New. Uh, quite a pedigree with him. You know, we've documented over the past years of how he, he, he came up, one of the most prolific co-anglers in history, then transitioned to the front of the boat, his relationship with Brian Thrift growing up in the uh, Carolina, uh, North Carolina area, then moving to South Carolina, now winning the first Bassmaster Elite Series event uh, that he fished in, 44 top 10s with FLW, now MLF. And, and Brian went into some real interesting stuff about finding fish fast because if you watch him fish, it's kind of like a tornado and there's not a lot of room to breathe. It's, it's red bulls and 6,000 RPMs. Uh, and, and, and he's still young. He's got a lot. Another dude who, uh, who got into this thing young and has just been dominating ever since that's Jacob Wheeler. It's been a minute since we've had Wheeler on. I think he's got a clothing brand, a tackle brand and a boat company now since the last time we've had him on uh, BTL. If I'm correct, I'm sure I'm missing some stuff out there. Uh, oh, yeah, he's got another uh, another BPT trophy, the sixth on his mantle. Jacob, thanks for jumping on BTL this afternoon. I know you got to be busy. Yeah, man, absolutely. I, I appreciate you having me on. Obviously, I make time to, to, to be able to, to talk with BTL listeners. And obviously, man, it's always uh, it's always fun to catch up. All right, we're going to get into this win on Gunnersville because every once in a while you have something unique that goes down. Um, I'd already booked you for this deal. And then I got a call from a BPT angler who has caught a few fish on Gunnersville and has lifted a few trophies in his day. And he was a little, I don't know what word I've used it. I don't want to say shocked, but he was a little, uh, he basically said that you just kicked everyone's ass off the exact same stuff and that you were just better than everyone. That's basically <laughs> word for word what he said. Dang, dang. Yeah, I I, uh, I don't even know <laughs> what to say on that. I, um, I I was not. It was definitely not about um, necessarily the spots. It was definitely, you know, figuring out, um, you know, figuring out a technique that you get to generate a bite. You know, it's, the pressure is is everything in the sport right now, and 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 figuring out something just a little bit different that the fish haven't seen that much is is really important. It is. That is uh, one heck of a backdrop, by the way. Uh, probably one of the top five backdrops that we've had. Is the new one up there yet? It is actually. So this is actually my wife sort of just did this for me. Um, we just moved in our new house. And so we have uh, a good combination of the trophy trophy wall. I actually just sort of set up this, this whole, this, we got the ping pong table. got some, I got some, uh, got some jerseys in the background, the Jersey wall. So it's, we're just still getting it together. We just got into our new place. And so, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's definitely a, uh, it's a trophy room, so it's sort of a sort of hangout. Yeah, spot. you already screwed up. There's no room for more big trophies. It's already filled up, man. What are you gonna do? You gonna add another uh, wall? So, so actually, we were taught. So they actually messed up the trophy case, and they're supposed <laughs> to be able to like utilize like there's supposed to be two rows, so right? Grow, so now we're sort of uh, I don't. I mean, we'll well, you never know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll work on it. Right now, it's fine. I mean, that's gonna be a problem within six months. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have right now it's staggered on like this one right here is in front of like the that's the newest uh trophy right there. The gun yeah. trophy and over the years behind that, another one's behind that. So you have like three in one little bit. It's it's whatever. Listen, the trophies really don't matter that much in the day. You just sort of they're great to hoist, they're awesome to have, but it's like um 
it's the moments that last more than anything. You know, you go back in here, like, you know, five years down the road, I remember the last time, like maybe like like two years ago, I touched the, the touched the Forcewood Cup trophy for like mm-hmm. the first time for like seven years. And just the memories that that brought back was super impactful. And so I think that's the biggest thing that I, I, I take a trophy. I don't look at it as like, you know, it's an accomplishment. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff to be proud about. But there's something that um, each trophy has is those those memories that are attached with it. And that's sort of the most important thing. Yeah. Who was it who kept their Forest Wood Cup trophy in the closet? One of those guys had, we did like it did the, I don't, was it Hawk? It might have been Hawk for a while or something. We did something where he he like was showing the closet and he's like, there's the Forest Wood Cup trophy. And it was like just hanging out in the closet. Yeah. I, th- I think I'm pretty sure it was. I'm pretty sure it was. Yeah. I, I, I do remember that. Do you have the 2011 All American trophy up there? I do. It's, um, Top, but it's right, it's right there. Wait a second. You won the All American, and they gave you the standard BFL trophy, and just put All American on it. Yeah. Go grab, well, no, it. go grab that little, thing. It's a little larger. Look, it's a little bit larger. So I have a BFL. Hold on, I'll show you. So here's a BFL. Here's a BFL one. Okay, and here's okay. the All American trophy. Okay, it's slightly larger. So it's a bigger. It's still the yeah. It's 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 similar, but it's this. It's yeah. it's hey. If you flip those over, does it say MTM recognition on the bottom of it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's yeah. that's Big Dave Smith out of uh, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. MTM recognition. Dude's done all the trophies for uh, for as long as I guess for as long as I can remember. Yeah. So at one crazy. point, all of those trophies you have have been in Oklahoma City, Norman that's area. Cool. That is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on your sixth win that had to feel good after just a brutal 75th at, at Lake Murray, just bottom of the barrel, Jacob Wheeler. I mean, man, we thought, we thought your days of winning were over after that 75th place tank. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I actually that, that did mess with me. It did. It did. did it really? Me- Mentally. I was a little bit, I was pissed off. I was, I was very irritated. I, 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 I just missed it. And it and, and, and doesn't happen very often, but it happens. And everybody's going to have bad tournaments, but, like, that one irritated me a lot. Um, and, 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 and as much as, like, I feel like I'm, a, I'm now becoming a seasoned, seasoned veteran, I've never fished a, a herring spawn on a lake before in my life. And so I never knew no. anything about it. Really? No, I never have. I never have. So that was wow. something that was really new to me. And then I was also trying to learn, you know, do I want to commit to this? Do I want to be – you know, do something a little bit different. And I, I, I felt like the fish were leaving the bank, but then there was new ones coming and I didn't realize. So like I made the, some really bad decisions in that tournament. And so I, that one bothered me, but you learn more from those tournaments than any other tournament. Like the ones that you're like, you have bad tournaments. You're just like, dang, what did I do wrong? And you analyze it a little bit more where if you have a good tournament you win or you get top five, you're like, well, yep. It went as good as it could have, you know? So you don't really learn that much there. But so like, I, I feel like, so like all my tournaments, I feel like I look back typically when I have a bad one, I typically have a really good one right after that. Just because it's like my mind is, is a little bit different. And it also sort of knocked me out of the angle of the year race. So that also let me like, sort of like my mind, like refocus and like, okay, how do I win tournaments this year? Like how, refocus this energy of like consistency and then move to like, all right, what do I need to do to win Gunnersville? Boy, if you learn, if you're supposed to learn more from bad tournaments, I am learning one heck of a lot. <laughs> I've <laughs> learned it every time I go out. You're going to learn every time you go out, but you know what I'm saying? Like you, you do. What'd learn- you learn at Murray? What, what'd you learn that you thought you knew that afterwards you look back uh, I'd feel free to go into as much detail as you want on that because I know you you'll keep some of that stuff under your hats because you'll sure. probably top five at the next time. No, I, it was just the thing is about like a fisherman, and, and we always try to like look at a weather trend. Okay, like we try to look at this weather pattern. Like it's a warmer year. It's Bass have been spawning since February. Oh, they're going to be doing this. They're going to be out there on the herring spawn early. They're going to be out offshore early. And it's crazy because even though it was an earlier year, it became a trickle spawn. 
Like when the elites went there, they were still catching them on bed. Like it became a deal where it literally it started in February spawning there and it, it went still to where they were spawning when they, you know, even if it wasn't an early season. And so it came to a point where I'm like, I, I thought it was going to be one thing. I thought, you know, I try to pride myself on being versatile and trying to adjust to like conditions that like, and be able to be like, okay, I had the herring spawn deal, a few of those places. And then I had, you know, the, the like spawning fish happen, you know, happening as well. And so like, sometimes when you try to do too much, number one, I got in the wrong area of the lake. Like I felt like I focused on a different area of the lake and for whatever reason, like they just, it, the herring spawn was not happening everywhere. It was more Creek related earlier on, which is typical because like a shad spawn happens in the creeks first, then it starts to happen on the main lake. So like it starts the backs of the creeks because it, it all it does is follow the bass spawn. It's bass spawn the backs of the creeks first, then they spawn in pockets in the creeks. Then all of a sudden they spawn the main lake. It's the exact same sort of scenario that happens on the herring spawn. And so like, I just didn't take that knowledge that I knew on that. And, and, and so what was happening is the, the, the stripers were on places earlier on the main lake. And so you're catching all these stripers, striper, 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 striper. And it wasn't like, but then you catch a five pound largemouth, mm -hmm. you know, but there just wasn't that many of them there. So then you just, you, you got enough bites to get you like intrigued, but like, it was a very, it was a tough tournament because like it, you could catch them any way you wanted to. And I just didn't like focus on one thing. And like, if I would have just focused all in on one deal, I felt like I'd have been in a lot better position. But then you went to Gunnersville saying, hey, I'm going to win this one. No, I mean, the TBA has been really good to me, you know, like I, I, I obviously, yes. I, I, I called up Newell and I talked to Newell and I'm like, and I, when I get like after a bad term and I'm like, I'm going to win the next five, you know, you just, you just mentally, you're like, you have to fo refocus. I'm going to, mm -hmm. you know, but like for real, like I was like, my goal is to win my, now my, my number one goal this season is to win one tournament. And then if you win one tournament, your goal is to win two, you know, that's just always, you refocus that energy. It's like, you don't accomplish your, you accomplish your goal and then you reset another goal. Just like, cause that's just always how it is. Like, you know, when I had a, a tough tournament, um, when I, when I ended up winning of the year against Odd uh, and I were battling back and forth, it was crazy. He won two that year. I ended up winning three. That year, I had a bad tournament on Harris Chain. I went back and I got second to Kevin on on, on Chickamauga. I won it it, it um at the St. Lawrence River and then I won again at Champlain. And so it was like, but the same thing happened. I focused, man. I'm out of the anger of the year. I'm 35 points back. 40 points back, I need to win to even have a chance to make it an angle of the year. So my mindset was, hey, let's focus on winning. And it just happened to be to happen that way. So it's like it's weird. I don't, I don't know how to really it, it's sort of interesting, like in that scenario of like mm -hmm. how it all, all played out. But you did say it sounds like you made some decisions to go for the win instead of stay in the angler of the year risk, which or stay in the angler of the year race, which means does that mean you're more likely to, to take risks? Yeah, like you, so like, so like in the angler of the year, you, you like in that scenario at Gunnersville, I spent most of my time out offshore practicing offshore because that's what I love to do. And I also felt like mm -hmm. it was going to be warm that way. And if I was directly in the, in the angler of the year race, I would always have to have a backup. So I'm going to spend at least four of my hours of my practice time on the bank looking for bluegill spawn, looking for just another thing that like, hey, look, if the world comes to an end and there's not a bass out here offshore and I cannot get on a spot, I'm going to be able to go catch 15 pounds to keep me at par for the day. And so in that scenario, I was able to refocus and use, utilize that, that same amount of time that I might have focused on, you know, that would have drawn my attention off of what I really needed to do to win. Mm -hmm. To completely focus on winning the event. That's good stuff. You know, I'm a numbers guy. Uh, I think the last time you were on, we, I, I had calculated the numbers because you're using a little bit heavier pound test on thousand islands and you're getting the small mouth in like 30 to 40 seconds quicker. It might not have even been that much than all the other competitors, but then you extrapolate that out times 40 or 50 fish a day. And you're actually fishing for an additional half hour a day. You extrapolate that out times 
four days because that was when they had the cut. You're actually getting two more hours of fishing time. You're averaging a fish every 11 minutes. You're actually, because of how much shorter you're fighting the fish, you're able to catch five additional fish, averaging four pounds. You're basically getting 20 pounds on the field. Remember that whole scenario? Yes, I do remember that whole scenario. Well, your, your article on uh, MLF kind of reminded me of the same thing using the strategy where you have the two combined days with the five fish limit, the weight zero, there's no like win and you go straight to the championship round anymore. So that, that incentive is out. And then the final two days are combined. And you said in here uh, that you were only fishing for a period and a quarter, which means you basically had a, a half day, which would be uh, I could extrapolate that out times the two for the first two rounds. You're basically getting an additional practice day looking for schools of offshore fish while everyone else is battling it out and trying to stay on their fish and try to stay on it. And then it seemed like that as the fishery was changing was massive for you. I mean, you take the best in the world and you give them an extra practice day, which you manufactured in the tournament by practicing. But that sounds like it was a big key for you. That was huge. I mean, that was once I realized they were like, it was tough because I, I live on Chickamauga. You know, I live here yeah. on the lake and I love fishing the TVA. And so you're always trying to get an idea of exactly what's transpiring. And so like what's happening here a lot of times is sort of what's transpiring on, on a lot of other lakes on the TVA. Um, at least within, they're within days of each other. A lot of times, unless something else is going. Now, only thing about Gunnersville is, is there's a lot of grass. So that sort of throws a little bit more of a wrench in the plan. I didn't know, I, I didn't really know how that would affect the fish if they got hung up in the grass, you know, if they would, you know, not, they would wait to go offshore. So anyway, but, but, but last week I could definitely tell they were starting to move out and on here on, 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 on water. and there wasn't that many places though. I mean, it, there was like six to eight places, maybe 10 places on the whole lake. There was, there was actually a school of bass. And the majority of those were community places. And so I was to the point where I'm like, okay, that's interesting. And then I, towards the end of last week or, you know, two weeks ago, there was a place that I graphed earlier in the week and they weren't there and they just showed up. Like there was like four bass there. And the next day there was 10 bass there. And so I'm like, okay, they're coming. I mean, which you, of course they're coming. You, you look at the weather and it warmed up and everything else. And so that all, like all of that prep time here helped me to sort of understand, okay, that's happening there as well, more than likely. So when I would see a place that I would see two bass on and I knew it was set up like a Tennessee River place, I'd mark it and say, put an icon on it, check this, you know, second day of the tournament. And I would go back to those places that have one or two bass and there'd be eight bass, there'd be 12 bass, there'd be 15 bass. And, and that was like, that was just the knowledge from understanding the TVA and how fast it transpires into getting to that point, like, and like, and understanding that. Now, of course it did help. Like I knew also because they were coming out so fast, um, like there was actually two places that I found in the tournament that I graphed and practiced and did not see a single bass, not one, but I'm like, dude, they, I know they got to get there. I just know it. And I graphed them in the tournament and they showed up in the tournament. Now there was only like seven or eight bass there. But I, I was able to have that in my back pocket if I needed one. I knew there was not going to be anybody else there. And there shouldn't be locals there at that point in time because they just got there. So that's the fishing to where they're going. Exactly. Not to yeah, where no, they I, are. You are literally fishing to where they're heading. I remember the first time I heard about that, it was like the 20, I think it was the 2013 Classic. It might not have been 13. It might have been the same. It was any one of those on Grand. And David Walker was talking about how he didn't catch hardly anything during practice, but he wasn't fishing where the fish were. And that he was banking on, he had tried to figure out where those fish were going to be on Grand in five days because the classic is a whole week ahead. So he was very optimistic that he had located where they were, didn't care about where they were right now because he knew by the time the tournament started that they're not going to be there. They're going to be somewhere else. So he spent his time trying to figure out guessing, guesstimating, using his experience where they were going to be fishing those areas, understanding those areas, knowing that there weren't any there right now. It's kind of the same thing you did. It's the exact same thing you did. Yeah, and it's sort of weather trend probably. He probably was on yeah. the second yep. point, and they were, like, warming up. So he's like, all right, I'm in the back of this creek. There's a little hard spot right here. They probably could set up right here for mm -hmm. the shack, sort of move up. Yeah, 
it's the exact same thing. It's just the reverse. It's like they're heading out or they're heading in. Yeah, you do. It, it is. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, it, it's tough to do. It's tough to do, especially when you're, you're trying to still qualify and get, you know, right. make your, you know, make it into, to the knockout rounds to, to, to fish the actual event. You mentioned something, uh, new mentioned it this morning. I've had it pounded into my head with the open that I had on Wheeler. It's a Tennessee river thing. You mentioned hard spot. It's very easy to say what a hard spot is, but just describe exactly what a hard spot is because that is like such a buzzword, but it's hard for me in my mind to picture what a hard spot is on a ledge or offshore where these fish are stopping. Okay. So this is a thing like all these, there's a lot of times people just are like, man, I, I got this sneaky little shell bed, you know, all this shell bed, this hard spot. Okay. Look, like a lot of times when I'm talking about a hard place, it just, if you graph over and use your side scan, okay. And you side scan down a ledge and it's, it's really like dark. Okay. And you're getting a dark signature return on your side imaging. That is soft bottom. Okay. Typically you're going to see that with Creek ledges. You're going to see that like, but typically on a TVA, anything that is facing into the current or, uh, you know, like anything that has a high, you know, a high spot that can, can, that that current pushes over it and pushes shell onto it, it's going to be hard. Front mouths of creeks, you know, st- high places, points, contour changes, that's going to be a hard place those fish utilize. That's also the primary place where they're in the front where the currents wait, you know, pushing bait to them. So that's sort of like the, the, now that's not every place. Let's right. put it that way. Every place is not driven by just current. There's a lot of places that are secondary, but that is what, when I'm saying a hard place, typically they're going to set up on harder, harder places, which are shell beds or, 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 you know, harder, you know, returns on your side imaging. But are person. they there because the bottom is harder or are they there because of what you just described where in most cases it's where the most food and the most nutrients and things are going to wash past them. And it just happens to be a hard spot. Yeah. I think it's a little bit of both. Okay. I think sometimes they don't care about it because I've, I've actually caught them on soft bottom places too. Okay. I have. I've caught them on places like grouped up hard on, on, on places that are not hard. Like they're like, they're grouped up like in a, in a, in a, in a group, literally a hundred yards off of where there would be a hard bottom area because that's the best place where they could ultimately feed. Okay. So there's, there's not always, it does not always play that way. There's times that, they will choose it, it just whatever gives them the best the best opportunity to, to, to feed is really I, got you. I think that trumps more than hard spot hard bottom how often do you think they feed out there is it constant because it, it obviously you hear the timing thing you hear first in the morning in the tva you hear an afternoon bite you hear when they start generating are those fish just neutral on the bottom like we've seen on like wired to fish videos and stuff where they're just like sitting there and you're like oh my gosh there's 75 fish in this thing and they're laying on top of each other not active or are you seeing them like salmon or trout or river underneath like sitting there looking for stuff to come waiting for the shad like in your mind how does that look when you come up on a good hard spot offshore so i've never been able to understand it more now than with a forward facing sonar and, mm-hmm. and you know forward facing sonar is allowed for us to understand more about bass behavior and so like it it was crazy this craziest thing that happened during this whole event was ha- it happened in the knockout round And in the knockout round, we had two major storms that came rolling through. One was around 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And the other was in the afternoon, about 2, 30, 3 o'clock. And I was sitting on a community place and I caught a few fish as the storm was coming in. Um, And and I mean, there's a hundred bass sitting there and I'd see them. They follow my bait, follow my bait. I'd catch one and then another one would follow my bait and they'd group up and I'd cast over there. I'd, you know, maybe catch one. And all of a sudden that storm hit, you know, big weather burst, winds blowing against the current. And I'm like, okay, raining as hard as it could. I cast out there two minutes into the rain, catch a six pounder. Then I catch another big one. And and in the same time with score tracker, it's like, boom, 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 boom. Big one's caught, big one's caught, big one's caught. 
And I'm like, wow, like that was a big deal. Like that rain in that, like during that storm, they bit like no other. It was absolutely insane. Now, I'm not saying I couldn't have caught them, mm -hmm. but in that moment, it was crazy. And then later that day, while I was practicing it during the knockout, I was running around, checking stuff, sort of figuring some stuff out. Right before that rain came in, but an Otifo drops 24 pounds like that. You know, uh, if you look at like uh, Thar catches a giant one, a Out Jones Jr. trashes him and catches 20 mm -hmm. pounds in a matter of minutes. It happened like, and I wasn't even fishing at that point in time. I actually, yeah, I stopped and I made two casts. Like I threw a crankbait out there, didn't catch him, and I threw that deal out there and I caught a two and a half and a 414 that didn't help during the storm. And it was like, Dad, it was so crazy that that those storm bursts impacted that bite so much. Is that a low pressure deal? It has to be. I mean, it, it, it's something that they. I don't know if it's that they sense that and it's at low pressure and they fat they factor in that. Hey, look, it's pouring down rain. The wind's blowing. There's not a. There's not. There. It's time to feed. It's mystery. I, Still I, a mystery. I, no I, one's really been I, able I, to figure it out. I remember, I remember a time where uh, maybe Tom Monsoor at Kentucky Lake, and, and maybe it was Tom, I'm pretty sure it was Tom Monsoor. It, it was an old FLW tournament, and he talked about how he just, man, it, it was, un, I mean, it was like a real time report. You remember like when Newell did all those real time reports? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember a time where he said he caught him. He never could catch, he couldn't get him to fire, couldn't get him to fire, and then the storm came and he caught him every cast for 45 minutes. And I was like, I, I remember that. And I was like, huh. And I've never personally seen that happen until the other day. That's good stuff. Uh, I'm going to take a break when we get back. I want to get into this bait. I want to get into this technique. I don't know what you can or can't show. I know you're able to grab it, but I know there's also some stuff you can't really talk about at it officially, not out till I cast. What's the best time to win an event? Month or two, month before I cast. When a major event on a prototype bait a month before i cast but that being said like i said i talked to some other guys in this tournament and they said they said you had the goods and they didn't have the goods and that they were watching you catch up on the goods and that it was it was not only that you were on the the juice and the deal but that god how many how many cliches can i use for offshore fishing is not only that you were on the juice but you had the goods for the juice mm -hmm. fair breakdown yeah all right, I'm going to try to pry some stuff out of you when we come back. It is a bonus BTL at noon on a Tuesday with six-time BPT champion Jacob Wheeler. We'll be back right after this. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised, and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush. Eating kind of man. And on behalf of all of those bigger, I gotta say it once and for all, it's bad enough that the fish look smaller in our hands. The last thing we should have to worry about is getting quality outdoor clothing that fits. Avco, any fish, any water. Shoreline Boat and RV, dock rash, storm damage, collision repair, that deep scratch or gouge from trying to access that secret creek. Shoreline Boat and RV can get your prize possession back in mint condition and looking good on the water, fast. All repairs are done in-house, so they're able to get your boat or RV back to brand new, quickly. All Shoreline's work comes with a rock-solid warranty. Find out more at shorelineboatandrv.com. 
Kansas City, Austin, and Tulsa. All right, welcome back. BTL on a Tuesday special show with Jacob Wheeler. Uh, I have one more, one more hard spot TVA ledge fishing question for you. My buddy, Austin Cranford, who just, uh, who just finished third in the open on Wheeler. I was talking with Brian new about the different shad that were out on the ledges there. They had like little, look like little chartreuse tips on their tails mm-hmm. and stuff, but they didn't look like the normal shad that we normally see. Like he had a picture of one. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, you can. Yeah, there you go. Look, you can kind of see it. See the look at that. Yeah, it's got a little bit of yellow on the tail. Yeah. What is what are those different than just the normal like is there a different is that a different type of shad that has that little yellow stuff around them? Or is that just, like a, just like a thread like a, like a larger thread fin to me? Okay. To me, okay. those are just a little bit larger thread fin. They're like they're like four and a half inches long, is what it seemed like. Uh-huh. Four I mean meaty, like half. when you see them, you're like, dang, like a four pounder would love to eat that. Exact yes, correct. Correct. It's not like it, it's not a thread fin like the winter time. You're sitting out there in the middle of a drain, you know, two and a half inches long, and they're feeding up and they're spitting them up when you, you know, you hook one. They're four and a half, meaty, you know, chunky little, you know, chunky little thread fin. They're not, they're an easy snack. They are. All right. Uh, let's get into this. Cause like I said, this thing was very lure specific, uh, that you were able to not only catch a uh, 29, nine in the not dude, you were like, just, it's not how it works now, but like century belt was like, not even a thing. Like you'd have like mid one tens who, what do you think? Okay. Be honest here. Four day tournament, five fish. I mean, it was, it was basically like that, but under normal circumstances, four day tournament, five fish. What do you think your max weight could have been? I mean, would you have been pushing one fifteen? No, because I think that that I I know I could have caught a lot more, um, obviously, but like I don't think that it would have been that high. I think it would have been a hundred, you know, hundred, two hundred, three hundred, four somewhere in there. Because like I think I would have. I think I had like ninety eight or ninety seven pounds. Like if you what you put it up there, I think it was like yeah. nice maybe but you practice uh, for three quarters of the time except for the final yeah. day <laughs> and so like i know and so like the thing is like i don't know if it would have been i don't know i mean 25 pounds is is is, is catching them so like i if i would have caught some more four pounders and you know some more five five six pounders yeah i mean i think i think 105 pounds would have been a realistic number but I also right. because i practiced that was why the weights were as high as they were forming the knockout rounds, you know what I'm saying? So there's yep. it's sort of like a double-edged sword. It doesn't necessarily, oh, I would have loved this. And yeah, absolutely. No, I see what you're saying. You'd have sat on other schools that you would have tried to maximize because but every ounce counted, but that makes sense. Yeah. All right, what can you yeah. show and tell about this bait? It's a, it's a rapple of plastic, right? It is. So, so um, two years ago, I, um, I, I had an opportunity um, and, uh, to develop a line of plastics. And so Rapala, um, was like, Hey, look, we're going to do this. I'm like, if we're going to do something, it's gotta be legit. You know, I want everything in line. Um, cause it's, it's so hard to like, when, when you think of plastics, how do you be innovative? Um, and so like my mindset is like three major things. Um, number one is it has to have good action. Like it can't be just a bait that looks good. It does not actually perform. Number two, it has to be um, the right durability. So like I can catch a couple of, you know, nice fish on it. Um, and, and I don't have to go through, you know, you know, not one, ideally not one, as long as I can get the action out of it without making it super, super, super soft, then I want it to be as hard as I can get away with getting that right action where it, ultimately the, the angler gets the, the most out of that bait. And then three, it has to have really good colors. Um, and the packaging has to be good too. So there was really four major things. So that, like that was my mindset when developing, helping develop these products. And so um, with this bait, it was really came twofold. Like as I got moved into my house, as I was developing this bait, it's more of like a Demiki style bait in addition to like a, a vibrating jig trailer. 
And so like one thing that I learned very quickly is it's difficult to make a lure great at two things. Like you can make a lure that's good at, at two things, but to make it great, it's, it's sort of tough to do. Mm -hmm. um, so you sort of need to focus on like one major thing. Um, but this one, we were sort of able to do what I wanted to do on, for both. Because the vibrating jig, you know, I, I wanted to have it to where I could, you know, it would have the right action I wanted it. And then in addition to be able to, to, to hunt and do everything I needed to do there. Um, but then also really the Demiki side of it and, and Demiki fishing in general has transformed. And we sort of talked about that. I, and it's Demiki fishing originally is just over the top of them shaking, shaking it. So it's really not even a Demiki rig. Like now us casting a bait, I, I wouldn't even know what you call it. Like, you know, it, it, it's a shake. It, it's you're imparting an action into a minnow style bait, fluke style bait, whatever you want to call it. Demiki style bait and you're making cast and you're part of that action guy casting it. It's almost, it's originally what it was tight lining mm -hmm. back in the day. Like when guys used to tight line on bluff walls for small mouth, just keep it with the swing and then let the, swing let the momentum of the bait out. move it. Yeah. It's a little bit, it, it's evolved with four face sonar now because now we can target fish or a little bit differently. So, so jumping into like the backstory on this, as I was developing it, I, I, I threw it on several jig heads in my pool and I was playing with it. And, and, and I was like, Hey guys, we need to tweak one thing. I'm getting some action, I'm getting some stuff I want. Um, and so we made a tweak and then I got it, you know, we got it back and it was too much. And it was, see, the thing is in bass fishing is like now for like a subtle action is, is just as important as a, you know, a crazy action. Like that subtle difference can make a huge difference. You know, it can make a big, a, a big deal. So I I got back the the writ revision and I throw it in the pool and I'm like, okay, we got something. Like now, that being said, so the bait is a little bit larger. It's four plus inches long, um, a little bit bigger. So like thread fin aspect, like in the in the winter time. You know, if the fish are tight, you know, dialed in on really small bait, then you might be throwing a smaller soft plastic. But if they're on that little bit larger bait, that was different. So now going into this, now I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with you. Actually, I think Shin was the first one to actually sort of bring this, like he sort of had some stuff going on on the TVA here on Chickamauga. He caught him, I, I think he caught him on a minnow style bait and he caught him on um a cover scat, right? Mm -hmm. so like shin was the first one to really jump this he, not everybody knew because he was super secretive about it as well and i started playing shin with it then, and then i started playing with this bait. I didn't really even think when he's catching him shin loves dak like What's he's that? not shin loves dak like he's not just fluent in english when 100 yes, he does. you have a conversation with him any other day it's like talking with your buddy totally fine completely flew at 100 he catches him ah oh, no 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 i have no clue <laughs> sorry continue that just cracked me up exactly and and so so i want to give credit where credit's due on that one too for okay sure. there's a completely different deal with throwing a bait in for bait like for like in like bait balls and fishing for wintertime fish and doing this and fishing offshore schools of bass it's a, it's very different you know and, and it it's not the same like it has it's not done a lot you know what i'm saying yeah um so so with that being said like that was sort of like the rundown of like the before all this and so um when i i started playing with this bait and I went out on Chikamaga, like, again, you know, I'm playing with baits because again, we know like there's not any secrets anymore on the TVA. The schools are out there. Like, you know, you run down a ledge and there's, even if it's, you think it's sneaky, it's not anymore. Um, and if you make a cast on it and catch a bass on it, like, and, and somebody sees you, it's, it becomes a community hole very quickly. Um, so with that being said, all we have is anglers just figuring out baits that they'll bite a little bit better and, and having that as an advantage over the rest of the field. And so I went out here on Chickamauga and I played with it 
and I, and I caught a few fish and I could get more bites um, than any other bait, but I wasn't going to try to catch any big ones. And the day before I left, I, um, I went out and I, I went to a place that was one of the biggest community holes in the whole lake. Um, and it's bare, I mean, you could barely get a bite on that place. Like a lot of times it's so much pressure. And I catch a six and a half pounder in my first cast. And I said, oh, snap. Like that, this could be a big deal. So that's sort of the intro to all this and sort of like the backstory on it. Cause mm -hmm. I don't, you know, give a heads up on that. So, um, so the bait, I got both of them here um, that I threw. So the bait, um, it's called a freeloader. And, and so I, I really threw two different, um, two different colors. This one is uh, green shad. And this one right here um, is gizzard shad. One, you know, lighter back, one darker back. Um, this is a hybrid swim bait jig head from uh, BMC. Um, and, and so like for me, it really came down just what you were saying. Okay. I caught a bass in practice. He spit up that shad right there. Okay. And that That's was a thread. Bait. Okay. This bait has a lot more depth to it. It has more of more, a little bit more belly to it, okay. um, which, which, which has a little bit more, a different unique action, which also mimics that shad about perfect for what a lot of those fish were blowing up on and eating. Now, listen, big bass on the Tennessee river love gizzard shad, love them. But when a four and a half inch thread fin comes rolling through, that's a little meaty thread fin the big one's still going to bite that. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so that was another thing is like figuring out like what's too big and what's too small to generate a big bite. Mm -hmm. And that bait just tr it ended up being the right deal. Um, it's just ultimately what that bait, you know, and I'm, I'm casting it out there. I'm shaking it. And, I, and a lot of it, it, you don't, it didn't necessarily mean I had to throw that bait out there and I had to visually see them on active target or for, you know, active target too. Like I wasn't like I needed it. It was just that they would like, they could, I, it was crazy how well they could see this bait. Like they would ultimately, they could see it so well, like 10 feet above, above their head, they'd come up and bite it. Um, and so I think that's like, that's how they feed though. On the tennis river, you got to think like as a shad swims by, if a shad just swims right next to you, like they're not going to bite that. You know, like, okay. but if you swim it overhead, like that's how those fish feed, they feed up. All right. So when I just saw the picture of it and looked at it, like it looked pretty close to the bubbling shaker and it also looked a little bit like a spunk shad and that type of style, but it, it has some different characteristics in that it looks like a little bit more depth, a little deeper, a little. Yeah. So it has more depth. Um, that's one thing. Um, in addition to that, it has some ribs here. Yeah. The spunk shad's more of like, okay, originally the eye shad um, from Jack was the original. Okay. Um, like they they did that first and then spunk shad came out. And spunk, the tail okay, is yeah, I'm looking at that now. different, definitely different there too. Um, spunk shad's like appendage on the tail. He's real narrow. Okay. Um, this one has a little bit different and in, in, in my tails, the tail's not as long. That was a key. The difference is like point of their tail to where your hook point is important. Very much important too. Like if you have a big giant long tail, like to me, there's a very good fine line of too long of a tail and too short of a tail with you don't have the right action. So that was something I had to figure out as well. And that's the pool stuff. Yes. Okay. And that's also has some uh, one thing I can't tell you because it's what made the difference of the bait. And you'll have to see it at the pool later, and I'll tell you off record. But there was we one thing wait till I cast officially. Yeah, like you'll see what I'm talking about. Like there was a so basically all this is is it's a subtle scrounger, is what yeah. it is. Yeah, it's it's a subtle scrounger. So scroungers were killed the game on the Tennessee River for years. And so when you think of that. The, but it had a you know wider wobble, or if you had a good one, it had a good kick in action, and it would be a little bit tighter. This is even tighter than that. They were used to that signature of that vibration. They've seen it a hundred times over. Now you went even subtler, and you generate these big bites. So it's 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 a progression. Um, you know, it's not new as far as that goes, but I, I do truly believe it's it's the best bait out there on the market. Not yet on the market, but. <laughs> It will be. 
for that scenario, I caught, um, I only caught one bass the whole week on anything else. Like that, not even, I wow. did weigh that fish and it was a five one, but every single fish that I even caught at Lake Gunnersville came on that bait right there. Are the days of crashing big stuff that wiggles and wobbles and flashes and stuff done on these offshore schools on the TVAs? Jacob, is this, is this where we're all heading? No, mm -hmm. it's not done. There's, there's still times when you can trigger them into, there's, there's, there's times when it, you can, you have to throw, you know, I still have a progression of baits, but it was just so apparent to me. The reason why I threw that out the window of my knowledge of that, that my progression of my, my baits that I throw typically onto the TBA was because I was just generating big bites on that. And it was like, it didn't like, if you can throw a finesse tactic, typically you throw a finesse tactic in there and you pull them and you pull the group and you catch a couple two and a half and you, end up having 15 pounds and a guy comes in and drops 22 on the, on the scales, especially in the same places. And you're like, man, what were you doing? Ah, oh, man, I just threw a big crankbait in there and caught two seven pounders throughout the day. And that was the difference, you know, that, that, and that's, that's how it was. So mm -hmm. you can, but when I knew that I had a bait that was obviously general, and I've tried to and listen, I tried other soft plastic baits doing this and my roommates did too. <laughs> Trust me. Um, they were drugs and, and it was just apparent that for whatever reason, that signature of, of, of that action was lo and behold, the way to generate those bites. I don't know if it was, they were keying in on those thread fin. I don't know if it was just truly that match that had as, hatch aspect. I don't know if it was just unique in that way, but it was just, it was very, very apparent. You could go on the biggest community hole on the lake and sit by somebody else and catch them every cast when somebody else was not even getting a bite. I've had this conversation with a lot of people recently. Do you think these fish are starting to feel the forward facing sonar, whatever the ping, the click, the deal of that is and longer casts and more finesse and distance away from the boat is starting to make a bigger difference. Or do you think it's just that there's more guys fishing for the school? So they get skittish as soon as they hear anything. Cause they know that they associate that with negativity. There's a few things that come into that. Okay. One lack of current, how they, they move around. So lack of current, can, what I'm saying, so lack of current of them moving around, okay, lack of current in that scenario. If there's no current, they get up off the bottom more, okay, so then they move around a lot more, so then they're, like, more susceptible. If you move, if you make a lot of noise, what are they going to do? Swim to you, okay? So longer casts are important there. Um, Wait, do swim I, to if, you? Yes. If you make noise in your boat, those fish are going to go towards you. Yeah. You saying this know. like this is like this is a known thing? Yeah, I mean they they're curious. They want to know large mouth, yes. not small mouth. Large mouth will swim to you until they get about forty feet out, and they'll sit there and they're like, Psst. "All right, thanks a lot, big dog." So they'll hear something, be like, "What the hell is that?" Swim off of their spot, be like, "Yeah, don't feel like I really have a burning desire to be around that structure up there," and then bounce. Especially with the lack of current. Really? Yeah. I've never heard that, dude. In all the interviews I've done, I've never heard that largemouth will swim off an offshore spot and come look at you. Mm -hmm. And you will. can see that now. Yeah, and that's, and that's why I'm saying that. This is stuff that I've learned over the last few years. And, it, and it's been, I don't know if it's been pressure, but they, they know. So a lot of it, I think, okay, I don't think they think it's a boat, to be fair. I think a lot of these largemouth, they hear moving in the water, you hit that, you drop your troller motor and you make a noise and you make a big splash and they come that way because what do they think? It's a shad ball that just got trashed by a group of fish. I think a okay. lot of times they're sort of intrigued and they want to know and they get over there and they can, I'm sorry, you can see 40, 50 feet. They can see 40, 50 feet. Like it's crazy. Uh, at least 30, at least 30. They know what's up at 40 very well. And so once they hear you, I feel like that, that, that there's a line when um, that ping gets to them and it seems to be around that 40 feet in that signature and they're like, see ya, out, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they know. And of course the bigger ones are going to know earlier. Now, now this is the difference, okay? So Caney Lake, Caney Lake down in Louisiana, smaller body of water, really big fish in it. 
those fish were the first fish I've ever seen that I truly could tell that when you would beam them, they knew at 70, 80 feet, they knew you were on them. Those were the first fish that I really, truly believed. A lot of fish know at like 40 feet. They get it. They know. Very few know at, at, at 80 feet. Like they don't really, it's not as, it's like, it's like a flashlight. You know, a flashlight was your 30, if I'm holding it right in front of your face, you, you're going to, you're going to know pretty dang well. Oh gosh, it's bright. What the heck? But if I pull off and I'm 80 feet from you and I beam that flashlight, it might not be, it's not as bright out there. It's not as bright. It doesn't have that much, you know, and I, but fish did. Mm-hmm. And so I had this. I had this conversation with somebody. I said, I said, I told, I told Kyle, I said, look, I think that these fish are not as pressured. And I'm not saying they're not pressure because it's gunner's work. But you got to think half of their Just year is spent in the grass. They're spent in the grass. So they don't ever get beamed. So when they get out there, especially right now, they're not, they're not used to that. Cause I, and now I, you know, there's times guys are like, oh, I'm turning my stuff away. Yeah. I did not see that. Like, there's, I'm a straight shooter. Like, listen, yes. Mm-hmm. Do I think they can play? Yes. Do I think bass are starting to understand that signature of that bean? Absolutely. Do I think that these fish and, and those fish did? No. 90% did not. And, and, until that threshold that the majority of bass, just no. I'm processing this. <laughs> I also think it's interesting that you were kind of the first one. Were you one of the first ones at the professional scene to win on the, I guess, Demiki straight Demiki rig, uh, the Cherokee Lake deal, which was the the straight vertical, which at the time, yeah, there were minnow baits, but that actual little three inch Demiki on the, you were still using the Moon Eye, I think, I on that. Eye, armor shed, but that was yep. what, 18, 2018? I think it was 17. 17, 18, 19, 20. So six years later, it's amazing. You just look at the progression because I mean, all this look at that progression kind of full circle from that little bitty thing that you're throwing horizontally or, or vertically on small mouth real wow. early in the year to cold to the same general style technique twice the size on a ledges and hard spots on Lake Gunnersville in post spotted early summer and there's so many relations between those two six years apart it's cool that you can actually see the progression of the sport and the baits and the growth kind of just in that little snapshot it, it really is like it's it's mind-blowing like to where we were and now where we're at like you're right it's it's it is mind-blowing like when you think about it like back like where i'm used oh man i remember i was getting oh man i was using 83 kilohertz over there at, on 2d and uh at cherokee so i had a broader beam so i could see them when they would move up on my bait I'm like, man, I'm so dialed in on my electronics. Oh, I got this dialed in. Like these guys are using 200 or, you know, I'm like, oh, dial. now you're like, oh, I can see them 80 feet out or I can see, you know, it's like, wait, what? Um, It's nuts. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got time for one more segment? Cause I just want to briefly touch on boats, baits and clothes when we come back. Cause yeah, you're starting a, you're starting an empire over there. <laughs> You're going to be like Boyd Duckett where every single thing outside. Well, you're with more because he, he doesn't own yet. Well, no, he's got the, the Duckett Marine. Same thing. Like mm-hmm. everything you use has, it's like yours or you owed it or you built it or you designed it. Man, I, I mean, there's yeah. nothing wrong with it. It's kind of cool. All right. If you're good with that, we're, we're going to take a break. Uh, when we come back more with Jacob Wheeler, kind of blew my mind with that last segment. There's some stuff there that I hadn't heard that it took me a minute ah. to process. I gave it up. I said, heck, if I'm going to do it, I'll give it on BTL. I'm not sure how to like turn it into me catching more fish. Like, I'm sure it's just going to me going, oh, look, they're curious and I still can't catch them. But yeah. No. No, BTL on a Tuesday. We'll be back (laughs) right after this. Have you considered purchasing new electronics for your rig? The type of mounts you choose to protect your investment should be part of the decision making process. No matter if you prefer one, two, or three graphs up front, Beatdown Outdoors has a solution for you. Adjustable, versatile, rigid, and made in the USA. What's your ultimate electronic setup? Check out the full selection of Beatdown Outdoors products by visiting beatdownoutdoors.com. 
I'm the kind of guy that never leaves a house without a pocket knife, and Gamagatsu's come out with the EDC series of knives. EDC stands for everyday carry, so whether you're on the water or off, you can always have it with you. The best thing about it to me is that assisted open feature. With this D2 blade, you've got it right here at your fingertips, so if you can't find your scissors, you need to cut a knot, you need to cut your braid, you've always got it. Make sure you check it out. Never leave home without your Gamagatsu EDC knife. Born in Japan, using technology, innovation, and precision, Sunline produces the widest selection of fishing lines at the most technologically advanced line factory in the world. Manufactured at the strictest tolerances to produce victories at the highest levels of tournament bass fishing, from household names like Christie, Swindle, and Cruz, to young guns like Cook, Logan, New, and Welcher, they all trust Sunline to take them to the top of the leaderboard. Choose the line that will give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. Sunline. The great thing about the new Sensation Soft Plastics from Big Bite Baits, heavily scented, super soft, buoyant, comes in seven great new shapes. I've got a couple of them of my signature series, the Cliffhanger Worm and the Ram Tail Craw. Great for a flipping jig, football jig, swim jig, all that. Several other great shapes. Really excited about it. We've worked over the last year. Catches fish all over the country, and I think it's going to catch fish for people everywhere you try it. The Spro Little John crankbait has been around for almost 15 years and it is one of my go-to crankbaits whenever I need a fish in the boat. So you can never have enough new colors. That's why Spro is coming out with a handful of new colors including Pearl Shad which has this bleached out white look but it's got this pearlescent really really pretty. We've got Copper Shad which looks amazing in the water. It's got that purple flake on the back really really pops in the water. And then if you want some real pop, we've got Sparkle Shad, nothing but sparkles all over this thing. And then last but not least, we've got the Matte Sexy Shad, just a really different looking color for a crankbait. So you wanna give them a little different look, that Matte Sexy Shad is definitely the one to go with. All these colors are available in the original Little John and the MD. All right, we're back, BTL. I'm furiously perusing YouTube. I'm trying to find the Wells Catfish deal. I think it's called s Sculling or something like that, where they take that paddle and they beat it on the water, and it, like, attracts the catfish, and they come up, and then they catch them underneath the boat. Well, yeah, I know. I've not seen that. I just see them always throwing those ploppers and going back and forth and, like, drawing them No, out. they do this deal where they, like, take it. And I've also seen them do uh, the striper down on Lake Texoma. The guy will take a big paddle, the, the guide, and everyone's using it, and he'll just, bam, flat right on the water. Bam, flat right on the water. Like, four or five times, and then everyone will drop their live shad down. Same yeah. same theory. Yeah. I can see that, especially on nomadic fish that are just focused. They're just all they're doing is they're thinking about that. Where where's the shack? Like what's what's happening? Oh, they're feeding fish are over there. I mean, that's that's what that definitely is. I mean, I've seen it for sure. How long ago was the hydro wave craze? I mean, there was a time there where I literally was like, dude, I can't, I can't go fishing without the hydro wave on. Like, how are they gonna, you know, how are they not gonna get my pow KVD power pattern shad? Like, that's the only reason I'm catching them. Yeah, I, I um, that's like 10 years ago. That was, yeah, five, 10 years ago. 10 you years still ago. have one of those? You know what? I never got on that craze. I, I think I had what I had it on there one time and I fried it and early in the season. I just said, ah, whatever. Wait, are you BSing me? No. So I, you're never... saying that noise in the boat will draw fish to the boat because they're curious, but you don't want a hydro wave on your boat. Do you think that there's a potential yeah, for that? Want... To... I don't want them coming to the boat because if they're out there and I'm able to make the cast before they I see what you're boat, saying. You're not trying to catch the curious ones. You want them before they're, they're curious. 40 feet, it's over. You know what I'm saying? Like if they're 40 feet, like if once they get to 40, it's like, boop, oh, now it's going to be a small mouth. But small mouth are getting the same way. Are they? Yeah. They're Wait, not. I'm still trying to, to comprehend that you need to be quiet in the boat, not so you don't scare the fish, but so you don't attract the fish from where you're attempting to catch them from. <laughs> so, so now the Absolutely fish are in between. Not. Yeah. Like you don't want, you want them to be very comfortable in the way that they're set mm -hmm. up. Like if they're set up, we're in ambush mode and you make your cast, you're going to catch one. 
if you jack up that ambush mode of them being set up on a brush pile, a rock, a whatever, and pull them, again, not only thing that trumps that is current because current forces them to stay there a lot of times. Um, but that is, that's a big deal, man. I personally, I feel like it is. I mean, I, I, this is not something I've talked to a lot of people about, but I'm just, I feel like that's something that I've, I've just personally seen over the years. And that's from multiple different fisheries used to, they come on your boat and you would just drop your, you know, drop mm -hmm. your drop down. That's what would happen. I guess we're like dropping on them came. Now you can get, I mean, now you still can catch small amount of drop on them, like on 2D, but it's just like, it's harder because now everybody's able to make those casts. That's not to say the hydro wave can't be effective. There are specific times. You're talking about a school oh, of fish. You're not talking about roaming fish or in the fall or when they're feeding on bait or anything. You're talking about this specific. So it's not like you're saying, hey, this is, you know what I mean? Like this is just in this no, scenario. No, I'm, I'm just saying that in that scenario, like I just, I don't use it. Yeah. But I mean, I'd, I'd rather have the, the element of surprise and let them suckers know I'm there. Uh, Clay wants to jump on the bandwagon. He says, if you ask about the hydro, you need to ask him about bait fuel. What are your thoughts on that? Work? Not work? I mean, I don't know. Are you like, do you have a scent propriety? Are you sponsored by a scent? I'm not a big scent guy on a lot of things other than smallmouth. And so for me, I've never bought any. So I don't know. Okay. But I, I don't believe that scent is as big a deal as some people think it is. Sometimes it can be. I can see it during one of my one of my good friends, Sean Wieda, owns Wieda's Marine. He's one of the best flippers I've ever met in my entire life. And he, I remember a long time ago, he talked about how he really felt like around the spawn that scent is a huge deal. And so he caught a lot of his fish around the spawn with scent. And, and now, and this being said, smallmouth, I, I don't think it hurts. Smallmouth, I definitely think it matters, and I've seen it matter in certain scenarios. And I think that it's other times, I feel like it just matters. Listen, I don't think some – listen, Zoom is one of the number one selling soft plastic companies in the, in the country, and they have – it smells like plastic. And the bass eat it still to this day, eat it just like they used to. Like, I mean, they still buy the old monster worm. They still – I mean, that's just – so I that's why it's hard for me, but I do – it doesn't hurt, okay? Mm -hmm. My opinion, it does not hurt anything. You know what I miss? I miss the days of the garlic, the strawberry, and the grape. Remember, we used to open up a pack like back in the day as a kid, and I mean, it just it smelled so good. Strawberry and grape. Yeah, like the jelly worms and all that. Like you did, you get all those I, scented. I get all that. Mm. Yeah, it's it smells so garlic. good. Yes. Like chompers, garlic. Yeah. The chompers bag, like, Ooh. because I fished as a co-eggler back then. Oh, could you, I remember, oh, you open up that chompers twin tail hula grub I at about up. 95 degrees. And it literally smells like you just robbed an Italian restaurant for the remainder of the day. Then it's like slimy on your hands. You're in this other dude's boat. Of course, you're like 16. You didn't bring any, any, you're like trying to figure out what the hell to do. You like wash your hands. It's still slimy. I was like, I know the chompers one to me was like the big, like the, the, the like you would be like downwind to somebody, you'd open it up and be like, whoa, dude, what, what you got up there? <laughs> the bang combo, the garlic combo brings back a lot of fond memories for me. Same here. Same here. A lot of fond memories of the club tournaments because all the old guys had the, the bang garlic combo and they just psh, oh, on their producto yeah. black, grape, red <laughs> glitter. They'd have it in the back seat of their boat, or like, or like on, like, like they'd have it on, like the, they'd have the it like a cup holder, or like yeah, a the, the black boat. holder on the butt seat. Yes, and they'd grab it out. Yep, and it just, it just, just a haze of it just headed your way right towards the back of the boat. One of those deals, yes, literally. I, no, my uncle was on that. Listen, um, my uncle got me started in bass fishing, and that it was part of it. My dad and my uncle both, and. Um, he was on that bang garlic bag more than anything else. It was so funny. I mean, he just loved it. Dude, she, I'd be over here like, <laughs> dang, Uncle Mo, don't do that anymore, man. She, man, it's getting, you can't smell it. <laughs> the whole club, it was like a cult. The whole club was, yeah. Throwing. You got, you got the bang garlic. You got that bang garlic. Yeah. You got that 
crawfish. It just came out like crawfish scent. You ready to go get that crawfish Did scent? they all wear jeans with no belt too and then sit on the butt seat to where you had to look at the butt crack for the entire day from the back of the boat while they slow wormed their garlic product? That was a typical day. Yep, that was a typical day on, on, on an Indiana Lake fishing the club tournament. It's about right. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that brings back so many memories. Carl Jacobs is still, he's still all in on the bang. Remember, he was he was doing it like every two casts when he went on Ted Killer. See, I, I know, and it's it's interesting because I, I I think there's something to it. Like there's um there's definitely something to it. I mean, there is, I get it, but like as long as it gives you confidence, that's the biggest key yeah. to fishing. But if you listen to some, they're like, the bang sucks because it's oil-based. They're like, it can't disperse. And then it's like the water base sucks because it doesn't leave a trail. So you can't, so it's like, I have no idea what to believe, but my, I would always keep the bang on until like, if you had the jig and you sprayed it and when you plopped it in the water, there wasn't a little ring of oil that came off. That's when I knew it was time to reapply. Yep. Yep. That's, that's a good point. That's a good point. Like that. Yeah. I, I don't know. Cause I'm like, I think, I, you know, I put like, I had a, I had a specific act, I had a specific that I sent that I wanted in the plastics, you know what I'm saying? And I actually like inject, we injected like, you know, there's a lot of stuff, but, but anyway. So can like, we go back to that? Can we stay with that for a second? What? Well, no, I can't. I, I Wait, can't you're talk doing about, it now, or are you used to? No, I'm not inject. It, it, this is like something that's happening right now. So people are injecting their. I know you want to move on, but I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable. People are like using some no, 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 so and it, stuff it, and inject. So it's like a gusher. They're fishing gushers out there now. No, it's. it's not I, I don't even know exactly what i can say because like I, obviously it's based on out yet so with okay. it was like it was the process of what we did with that bait and so okay. was like how can we make it last longer and so that was what like said because yeah. small mouth it does matter in spots i think it matters too large mm -hmm. mouth i think it's like a 50 50. i think it can matter a big time at times and, it, and some people think it matters a lot some people think people think it does not matter at all i think it's sort of like but like certain times of year, I'd rather have it than not have it. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Do you so, not remember the scent pellets that the plastics would come out and you would have like the little pellets that came with it and then you jam it into the plastic and it was supposed to slowly disperse as you fished your lizard? Yeah. You remember like the Alka-Seltzer freaking tabs and yeah. stuff? People used to like pitch on a bed fish. Like, oh, you need yep. this. It's crazy. I, I do remember that. The scent. Like, you stiff, stuck it in your tube, and they have an alka yeah. tab in there, and it'd be like, or like a scent pellet, and they put it in there. Yeah, I, they, I actually I, know uh, one, one of my, one of my really good friends, um, Wagner, he's, he's one of the best small fishermen I've ever fished, fished with, and um, he's big on scent. And so that, that's, and he's, and, and listen, that guy catches more small than anybody I know. Keith Wagner, he's he's um, an absolute stick, but he he's taught me a lot about scent, and um, so that's why I've believed a lot. Like you know, in the scenarios like, dude, I've made a cast with something that doesn't have scent. I'm gonna make another cast, and I catch ten bass. Like he's he, you know, it's it's a it's it's amazing on some of the things he's 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 taught me. Mm -hmm. How about the guys who wrap their shank of their hook with pipe cleaner? So that the scent gets absorbed into the pipe cleaner. Did you ever see that? There are a couple of yeah. guys who did that. I I, uh, I know some. Old, actually, actually, he did that. Actually, he taught me that. He said that that was the deal or something. I, We're beating a dead horse here, but I'll continue with it because the biggest scent tournament that I remember was Clear Lake Byron Velvic BV 3D Rego. He had the paper plate. He had those tubes of stuff. And the guy was literally making sandwiches out of the scent. I mean, dude, you couldn't even see the bait there. There was a quarter inch of scent around that dang thing. Caking it. Caking it. Remember that? I do. I was like, what the heck is he doing? Like, is this like, this must be a big deal. And I was like, I mean, but you know, I could see that with a big bait, maybe. Maybe. Maybe it would just like if you think about this, okay. Maybe that could trigger a fish, like, okay, especially in a big bait scenario. Think about big baits. Like there's so there's such a big drawing power to a big bait that like maybe if you could add one more thing, adding that scent could get one or two more fish to commit because you're gonna have a hundred of them following. You know what I'm saying throughout the day. So mm -hmm. if you can get 
one of those hundred to, to actually eat it because of the scent it's coming off of that bait. That, I mean, that's actually not a bad idea. That's the only thing that I actually, that, that to me, I'm like, okay, that one, like, I, I could see maybe a couple of them. Maybe you have three or four. Maybe if they're sitting there and they're following and they're like, and they get a little with that scent, maybe it makes up and impacts them enough where, but I, I don't necessarily feel like it's a, I, I do feel like it's a, it's a, a bite triggering deal. Like, I think it's, I don't think that just because you have scent is they're going to hold on to the, the bait longer. Me, I don't, I think like, I, I don't necessarily feel like they're going to hold on to it longer. I feel like it's going to be like, they're either going to bite it now and commit to it or they're mm-hmm. going to let it go by. Yeah, that's good stuff. Uh, and Scott Martin's most, or his video from Santee Cooper, he's all in on the bait pop. I mean, the bait dude pop. was, yeah, he was put, it's, that's the best of both worlds that not only shows up better on forward facing sodar, but also adds it a track. It never ends, dude. I mean, you could, you could end up dying, dipping, soaking, spraying, massaging yeah, stuff into your baits all day long. I remember like a big deal in the crappie world, or at least for my buddies back home in Indiana. They oh, like, I'm in hundred percent in on crappie. Crappie scent is massive. It's a big deal. Massive, huge deal. Huh? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, we'll use, I was just out two days ago and we were running low on minnows and we were just using little, we were literally taking the minnow and cutting chunks out of the minnow, putting it on our hair jigs just for the scent of the minnow. So they would commit to it. It had nothing to do with the actual minnow. I'm, I'm a firm believer in scent for crappie. So, I mean, there, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like I could see it, man. I, I could see it. I mean, there, I mean, I was crappie. I get it. I, I know I used to, I used to have like little, like uh little bites, like a uh, bur- baby bird. Crappie egg. nibbles. I still use those suckers all the time, man. Crappie nibbles. And my buddy Hell yeah. Was- Chartreuse crappie nibbles. Put two of them yeah. suckers on. You're bound to get well, bite. Yeah. I was like, I, I just never knew. I was like, but okay. But I, again, I'm not the best scent guy. So I'm not. Yeah. I'm- great point by Clay here. He said Skeet won that same year, I believe on Kentucky Lake, wasn't it? With that same bait, no scent. Remember there was a year there where the Rego yeah. BV3D uh, and the Skeet, there was a SKT and a BV3D. Smith? No, no, no. It was I'm, Kentucky, I'm, I thought. Okay. I thought he was throwing the throwing him with the bridge at Kentucky. I don't know. Was that what he wanted? Huh. Oh, no, Smith Mountain? That's what I said, Smith Mountain. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Smith Mountain. He told you. I was like, oh, I was. I know. Like, I should never question your... Fast fishing knowledge history. Like people, people don't give you enough credit. Like you might, I don't know if you could give Ken Duke a run for his money or I can do. Does Newell remember all that stuff, or does Newell just do his research before each event? Like I don't know if Newell's mind is like a steel trap. You need to have Newell on here. He is the most impressive. Like he has such different minds. Like I, I Newell's the man. I haven't. I've known him forever. Dude, Newell is so cool. Like a lot he, of respect for that guy. I I got so much respect for Newell. He works his tail off. He uh, he loves the sport. I mean, I just yeah, he's he knows so much. He knows a lot of history. He does. All right, how's the boat going? Icon launched at the classic. There'd been glimpses of it. The thing's out. Everyone's been in it. Put their hands on it. Run it. You've got a over a half season under it now. It's been good. It's been really good. It's except that the one thing about it. Um, so, well, from when launching the company, <clears throat> so HCB is a, a division, uh, HCB Yachts, Center Console Yachts. The first boat that we built was the LX Luxury. Um, in that boat, in that twenty one, it's a it's a big boat. It's it's a you know it's the Cadillac. It's not a Ferrari. So it's a Cadillac of our brand you know that's the one that it's going to be you know top of line mm-hmm. um you know throwing everything in it and, and so it's a little bit on the pricier side and as we sort of continue to go down um there's a lot of there's a lot of room for for uh long term it's a long term play so i got a little pushback on on some of the pricing and that that's not really me on that side that was just you know but um it was something that the boat's been really good it's been it's been well received there's been a lot of really um, some cool stuff about it. And, and overall, I just, it, it's out of the boat. I'll tell you this. I'll give the boat a 10 out of 10 for, for stability, 
for getting up on pad fast, for, for, uh, for dri driving maneuverability. Um, the one thing that boat is not, it's not a fast boat. It's a 63 to a 68 mile an hour boat. That's okay. what it is. That's just not, it's a great big water boat. It lifts well. It doesn't spear a wave. You're just not, if you're looking for a speed boat, that boat is not it. Not it's not going to be an Allison. That's no, there's definitely not going to be Dallas. But so that's, that's the thing. So like comfort, storage, all those things, it's, um, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. It's, it's been a lot of fun, man. I, I, I enjoy, I, I, I took it like a little bit, like, cause I coming out there, you know, when you're d starting a company and you're working and you're trying to like on this whole thing, like I working with the whole team and talking with the owners and working with all, all this whole thing, I'm like, you know, do we develop a boat that's a lower price point or do you develop a boat like that's high end and sort of work your way down? And it's like, listen, if you're going to develop a boat that's a lower price point, you're always going to be looked at as that lower price point boat. You, you can never build, you know, a high end boat because you're going to be looked at and viewed at as this boat right here. So always because that was your first impression. So that was really something that's like, this is a long-term play. We're not here for a flash and a pan. We're here to build mm -hmm. for everybody. And so that was sort of the reason why it came out that way. I don't think people realize whether it's a bass cat or a skeeter or a triton or a ranger or a vexus or a, a phoenix or an icon, how few high-end, top-level fiberglass bass boats are made each year uh yeah. it's not hundreds of thousands of these things i would venture to say it's not even tens of thousands of these things even if you combine them all how many of these things are in existence right now like are there a hundred in existence there's what how many are in existence right now there's uh um, i think it's right over 100 maybe yeah, right, right around 100 yeah that's wild that's a that's a that's that's cool to have your, your fingerprints on that. Are you also doing an entire clothing line for Magellan too? Um, so yeah, that was a really cool collection. The like this is like a Magellan hoodie. Like I uh, I was able to give the, they gave me the opportunity to do a Magellan lineup of clothes, and so I did some really cool stuff with the shorts. There's a lot more ventilation in the shorts, more of like a higher end. You know, Magellan Outdoors, and, and and what they've done is they've given a lot of people an opportunity to have a you know a good good pair of clothes for in good fishing clothing for for you know fairly inexpensive and so that's why i started working with them on on trying to develop some stuff like for my sun gloves you know like I'll, i wear those they're super thin you know and it's like grabbing a fish like they they dry out really quickly to to the buff and to your the you know your your gator like that those are the things that like i just sort of thought like okay like how can i make stuff a little bit different and they're all on you know academies and online as well but yeah that's that was a lot of fun too. I mean, that was sort of, it's cool. Like, you know, to have, have a hand in, in a lot of things, obviously it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's also something that's like to see signature series stuff and, and, and see anglers wearing that stuff from, you know, boat shoes. To, you know, <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. Signature series line of rods still going good. That was like years ago. That's old, old hat. Now, anything new coming out on, on that front? Um, I'm working on something. Oh, I'm working on something there too. <laughs> you gotta be working on a rod for this bait. Is there a name? Did you say before there's a name for this bait already? The freeloader. Freeloader. Okay. The freeloader. You working on a freeloader rod? So actually, that seven foot medium action rod that I have already short in my signature series is 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 unbelievable. So the whole key with that technique is you want a fast tip to impart that action, and then you want that backbone. So like you don't want like if you have a, if you don't have a fast tip, you can't really like pop it and do it. So that's like that's, but you don't want it too fast where it won't drive the hook at like eighty feet or seventy. Mm -hmm. feet. So you got to really, it's a fine line. I mean, I lost like one bass, one bass the whole whole week. So I don't, um, I I personally, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna design a rod for it because it seemed to work just fine. Okay. Uh <laughs> Line of soft plastics coming out at ICAST with Rapala. Mm -hmm. You say Rapala or Rapala? Rapala. Because it's technically Rapala. It's Lori Rapala who started the thing. If you Rapala. look at all their all their videos and stuff, it was Lori Rapala, correct? Correct. Yeah. There's still Rapala. guys that like 
have been on the Rapala team for decades that call him Rapalas. Yep. It, it, it seems like it's a, like more like in the South. I don't know. There's It's, it's all over the place, though, because there's certain like regions like you throw, you throw in the, the Rapalas. I'm like, in the Rapalas? You know, it just, yeah, it, it is. It's funny. I mean, whatever. It's, it's, it's tomato, tomato. What other signature series stuff do you have that I'm not taking into account? I have some some signature series Wiley X sunglasses. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's. I think it's about. I'm trying to think. Just, Does uh, most of this stuff come about like? Are they like they come to you and they're like, "Hey, are you interested in doing this?" Or do you go to the company and say, "Hey, I've got an idea for this stuff that I think could work," and then you design it and it works? Is it something that's already done that they're like, "Hey, can we slap your name on this because you move product?" Like, I mean, how does how do most of these come about? So it's a combination of, of a couple of things. Like one, it'd be like, hey, we want you to be the face of this, or hey, we want you to develop, help develop this. Um, it comes that way. I'll, you know, a lot of times I'll come, and, and I've also had it where I'm like, hey, look, I really like these pair of sunglasses, like Wiley X. Like, hey, I really, really like this pair of sunglasses. I want to tweak them. I like this frame. I like this lens. I want to tweak this lens and do this to this. Can we do that and have a center series? So it's a combination of it all. It just really just depends. Each company is different. Like with Icon, like I jumped in that boat. They had a running platform before. You know, I was with, I was with Triton for for years. You know, and I ran I ran their their DB boat, um, their mule boat actually. It's like not even like that. You just like a <laughs> just a running platform. Um, so like by the time I was done with my contract, I was able to even do anything with the Icon aspect. I had, you know, I was able to do storage and top cap and be able to sort of and help on that side of it. I wasn't really, you know, and I'm not an engineer. I'm not going to be the one that's sitting here, you know, just, you know, working on the the, the running surface of the boat and say, hey, I need to do this. And you guys need to do that. Like, I'm like, you, hey, all I'm telling you is I need this, right? Hey, I need that. Or I need more stability or, hey, I'm getting a little bit, I'm hitting too hard on this side of the boat. I don't know why that maybe there's weight here. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all over the board. You know, there's companies that approach people, you know, it's approached me in the past. There's, uh, there's ideas. It just sort of, it's a combination of it all. Uh, I do want to throw this up. I'm assuming this is what you were talking about with the rod. I mean, that's a long distance right there. And you're talking about that rod loading. Okay. 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 This is the funniest. Okay. This, this is actually really, really funny. See how I'm really horsing on this fish. Yeah. This is the dumbest thing I did the whole tournament. So I'm literally reeling this fish in and I'm like, dude, it, I set the hook and it's like, zzz, 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 zzz. catfish I, drum, like drum. And I'm yanking on it. I'm like, zzz, zzz. I literally pointed over there to the camera, but I'm like, comes up. It's a four nine. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> four and a half pounder. <laughs> it was a four nine. I'm like, now, little did I know, I, I called that fish out by the end of that day. But yeah. I was like, you're an idiot. Because who among us just doesn't call out pedestrian four I mean, nines? I, just, I mean, of every course, day. I knew that at the moment, I mean, but I was just, just like, of course, naturally, let's just call four and a half. <laughs> I mean, that just was like measly dude. four and a half. Dude, I, I, I was that day, that knockout round day was insane. I had my second best five weighed 22 nine. It was, and I, and I had like a 16 and a half pound spotted bass bag. It what? Was, was, yeah. I had like a 16. Oh, pound. now we're talking my language. Yeah. I didn't know that they had that many big ones in Gunners. Dude, I caught a 314, a 37, a 33. I forget. I was keeping up because every time I'd catch it, I'm like, did that call my spot? I was having fun, obviously. Real, yeah. man. You know, like, you're, you're like, oh, it's another three pounder. Oh, it's a spot. Get him in here. Let's weigh that one. <laughs> I just it was fun obviously it was fun all right what else you got before I let you go I appreciate it hour and 25 minutes in with a lot of juice with uh with the most recent BPT champ Jacob Wheeler I, I always you know we always we, we, we can talk off off the record a lot of times too it's always fun to to, to 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 sort of chat with you man you always have really good questions and we die, do a deep dive, and I'm like, man, you're one of the only only only, uh, only shows I go on to, to to give the give the goods up. So I like to I enjoy I'm I enjoy just talking. a nerd, man. I'm just a dork. Like I'm just I just to get into this stuff, and it that's intrigues all I, me. 
That's all I am too. I'm the same way. I'm just a student of the game. I love, I love basketball. I love the sport, man. You know what amazes me? It amazes me at how many guys reach the top level of the sport, have dedicated their lives to it, but have okay, there's like a kind of core similar philosophies over the thousands of interviews that I've done. You start to see patterns, but there's also wildly different ways to get to the same point. And each one has done it their way that works for the, I mean, you've done it better than anyone else. Statistically, you're looking at it. There's maybe like one or two guys in history at the point of the career that you're at that's done it. But how many guys have fed their families, made a career out of this, won trophies, made six, seven figures over the course of their career doing it such a vast different philosophies, right? I mean, yeah. have, you know, have you ever noticed that too? That's kind of what drives you, drives me mad as because I want to be a guy who's like, this is the right way to do it. Like in hockey, if you're chipping a puck out and you're a winger, there's a right way to get the puck out of the zone, off the glass, up and out and that. But fishing, that's what makes it so cool. Yeah, it does. Like you look at Ott, like, like Ott's a good friend of mine and, and, and Ott is a hard worker, but Ott gets off the water the second day of practice or every day of practice, like by like five o'clock. He goes have dinner, like if his family's there, he'll go have dinner. But then I'm out there till they like the last second. I'm running there. I remember like last year to you guys, I'm last second. And there's guys that just have a different way of processing information. And it like, that works better for them. If they figure out too much, or you know, it's like if they if they pre-practice that it messes them up. And like everybody has a different way of doing things. It, it is different. It, it, it's success is not defined by, by like the prep, your prep work. And that was, that's what works for me. And that's my system, but, and that's what works, but it, like everybody has their own way. Like you could, you can learn too much and have too much information to process in the tournament and never be able to actually get dialed in. And that's what negatively impacts you. Like oh, and I talked about that. We're like, look, I, he's like, I hate going in pre-practicing. It's like, I can't, like, it never helps me. And I always end up wasting a day of practice. And I'm like, dude, I, that's all I love it. Like I, I have a mo- I have a vision of what I'm seeing. I don't fish a lot, but I have a vision of like the, the playing field, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, it just, it all, it's, there's, there's not a right way or a wrong way to, to, to become a, I mean, to, to do, to do this deal, man. It's, it's um you got to do it your way. All right. We got a good show coming up tomorrow, folks. You got uh, Ben Milliken uh, coming on the show. He's going to break down uh, his finish on Wheeler. And we're gonna straighten some things out. We had a little, we had a, we had a vintage TVA. So he comes on the show all the time after every single event. Like, I never in my life ever thought I would be in a beef with Ben Milliken, and we just had a TVA ledge dust up. Oh, it's easy to do. It, 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 TVA is is tough, man. It's it, it's difficult. Communication is everything, and, and, and it's it's probably the worst for it because it just, yeah, it's tough. I get it, but I figure why why not talk about it live? Like he he thinks he's right, I think I'm right. We've had stuff go on. I heard there was maybe a little bit of a hullabaloo that went down out there on Gunnersville this week. Oh, maybe yeah. I maybe I heard that. Maybe there might have been a, a few disagreements out there on Lake Gunnersville in the BPT. Did you hear oh. about those? <laughs> I heard about them. Yeah, I mean, it happens. Look, that's it happens happen. in Wheeler. Happened on the Elite Series. It happens on everything. So hopefully we can turn it into an educational uh, educational experience. I might, I might have to tune in. I might have to tune in. Because, dude, what he's doing in the industry is, uh, I think, is really important with what it he's is. doing over there uh, at the Opens. Not only giving uh, the Opens that platform with his fan base, uh, but also having the success that he's doing with Bates that are non-traditional baits he's opening up a lot of eyes i'm sure i'm gonna get some hate like i said his his people are called them mfers they're looking <laughs> fishermen i'm sure my i'm sure i'll get yeah, some. you're gonna get tried yeah. no I, I think i don't know ben i don't know him at all i, I mean I, know, I think he's a great fisherman he seems like he's really dialed in on a lot of things oh but, dude he is and he's really really committed to the craft yeah, it seems that way, which I I all respect for anybody that works hard at, at what their their craft, you know. So, but yeah, I, I I'll I'll uh, I'm about to tune in. I'll, I'm gonna I'll be the mediator. <laughs> you be the be. Should yeah. I bring in bring They're in wrong. Jacob Wheeler as the mediator? All right, you have thirty seconds to respond. Exactly. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm telling you, that's really not a bad idea. I'm still trying to figure out how I want to how I want to do the show. It's very unique. Okay, so a TVA deal is a little bit unique, and there's scenarios that like it all depends on how it was handled. Like it all depends on how big a group it is. It all depends on like what it what it is. It's, it's You'll have very, to tune in tomorrow to see. I'm gonna find, I'm, I want to know. I want now. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to find. You have out. to tune. You have to tune in tomorrow. Tune in tomorrow, eight thirty a.m. Central Time, Wednesday, May twenty fourth. All right, I'm, I'm gonna have to do that then. All right, let me get the music going here. I always gotta end us off with some music. Oh 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 oh! Yeah. There it is. All right, you still there? TBA brawl, Hanger, Hanger, and Ben Miller can have their fight. <laughs> All right, this has been. Another edition of BTL, a special lunch edition. I'm actually hungry now because I didn't eat anything after the first one. It's 1.30. I have no, I have one cup of coffee in me. BTL with Jacob Wheeler. Jacob, you brought the juice. I greatly appreciate it. Congratulations on your win. Thank you. See ya. Thank you.